Welcome to module H lecture 3. In lecture 2, we discussed about the classification of urban goods movement demand. We said that the primary classification could be based on the spatial pattern of demand, external or internal, then based on the type of commodity, a wide range of commodity needs to be transported. So, we can classify uh, goods movement demand as per the commodity. The third is based on the size of the consignment and each economic units uh, have their own special pattern of goods transportation demand, type of the commodity they want to transport or they require to transport and the size of the consignment and the transport requirements also will get influenced by these factors. Then we discussed various factors which affect the goods movement. In continuation to our discussion, first we shall talk about the data requirement or the data related issues when we are thinking of goods transport demand modeling. Because demand estimation is a basic requirement whether it is for freight transport, whether it is for passenger transport. In the whole transportation sector, uh, the demand modeling or demand estimation, demand projection is very, very uh, important. Now, the data availability of data is always a problem for countries like India. Whenever we work even for uh, passenger transport demand modeling, then also getting the data is extremely difficult. Uh, the data availability is very poor and lot of efforts are actually we need to put for collecting the data. Whereas, in many other countries, such kind of data, especially the secondary database is uh, almost readily available and therefore, the it is up to the modeler that how best they can you know uh, model that uh, demand uh, using different available data and also probably based on collection of additional data as per the necessity. But availability of data about freight movements is the biggest issue for freight planners to use for planning activities. Simply the data is not available. So, whenever we talk about modeling approaches, there are many things possible, many advanced or uh, sophisticated models may be developed, but ultimately this all these models are to be calibrated. So, not the approach is not just sufficient, all this following these approaches the models are to be developed, they are to be calibrated and unless we have the data, uh, we cannot use uh, a model. Data collection is anyhow very expensive and resource intensive and from my own experience limited of course, I should tell that the collection of the data regarding the goods transport, goods movement, goods transport is extremely challenging. Passenger transport data is much easily available. Even if we have to collect the data, the data collection itself is much easier. Uh, we can go and interview commuters, uh, they have their own problems. So, uh, sometimes if they are convinced that uh, the uh, kind of data what we are looking for would help eventually the larger society, they are willing to provide data and okay, they are waiting at the bus stops or sometimes when they are travelling on board also, we do the survey, office based survey, household based survey, so many variety uh, of techniques are available. But freight transport data collection is very, very tedious and uh, it sometimes simply even after a lot of efforts, uh, putting lot of 
energy, put a lot of uh, financial resource, time resource, still you may not be able to get the data. Because one major problem is data on freight movements are held closely by shippers and carriers and they normally do not want to disclose the data. If you ask them, you need to understand probably how frequently they need to uh, transport goods, what kind of goods they are producing, how they are, you know, what is the price uh, that they are uh, or the cost they are incurring for transport uh, and all such kind of things. They are generally not interested to disclose such data to maintain competitive advantage. So that is a big bottleneck and challenge to get really good data for goods transport demand model development. Planners as a result left with practically very limited options and completely depend on the available data, whatever data is available, they have to work with that. So, planners often select analysis technique, not going by the merit of the technique, but more getting guided uh, by the available data. So, the available data, what data is available, what data could be available, made available, that will dominate and that will determine what kind of analysis we can do rather than determining the best techniques and according acquiring the necessary data to support those techniques because as I said it is sometimes just impossible. And even if it is possible, it is very very expensive, uh, resource intensive in terms of energy, in terms of effort, uh, in terms of financial resource, in terms of time resource and even after that also you may not really be able to get good amount of data. So, one has to keep these constraints in mind regarding the data and then as I said that depending on the available data, whatever best can be done, the modeling technique is selected accordingly. Rather than selecting a superior modeling technique in a standalone manner because it does not make sense, end of the day whatever a modeling approach you take, uh, the model has to be calibrated. While I said so, still it is important for all of us to understand what are different modeling approaches or methods or techniques that are normally used or that have been used by modeler for freight demand modeling. Again, as I said, starting from very simple approach to sophisticated approach, lot of techniques have been used or, or are available for use. Say for example, simple trend analysis and also a more advanced version could be time series models because we want to forecast. So, we can use the time series data if we know historically what has happened then we can simply project it. Elasticity methods, planners have used elasticity methods. Network models of economics and logistics that have also been used. Aggregate demand models, this is slightly I am looking at it from a different perspective, aggregate demand models or disaggregate demand models. Say for example, the time series model, elasticity, all these are also aggregate models, but there are other kinds of aggregate models which are also possible and you have studied four stage transportation planning with uh, respect to passenger transport and you know what I mean by aggregate models and disaggregate models. Also say approach like economic input output methods. So, all such kind of approaches techniques are available and you have to select a suitable technique 
as per the availability of the data. Now, because of the limitation of time, it is not really possible for us to go and discuss each of these approaches in details that we cannot do, but we shall uh, discuss it briefly some level of understanding that I want to give you. And maybe uh, some of you might be familiar with also uh, uh, so with some of these techniques and even if you are not familiar, but you want to use then you can study independently based on this preliminary understanding and uh, then you should be able to develop a model and apply it in the context of good transport demand modeling. Trend analysis is often done in, in various contexts starting from uh, population forecast to vehicle growth forecast, so many ways, so many reasons actually or application areas we use trend analysis. So, simply we know the how it has happened in the past in x axis time, y axis may be the, the variable which you are trying to uh, project or trying to get the trend and then you simply say how uh, over time what has been the growth rate annual growth rate or so and you calculate and then you project it with the same trend. It could be just simple extrapolation as I said of past historical trends using simple growth factor model or average growth rate you calculate and do it. You can also use several approaches which are well established, well known and which are related to the time series analysis. So, if the time series data is available, then you can use a variety of time series models. There are so many models are available, one of them is auto regressive integrated moving average method. There are so many other methods which are available and you can use them and uh, even if you really have the good data, uh, one can even use uh, some of the machine learning techniques to, to get it. Most cases we use simpler method because as I said that uh, if you are really ambitious and uh, you may be disappointed because uh, getting the data is really a big challenge in our uh, Indian context specifically. But the good thing with the trend analysis or, or this kind of time series models is they are simple to implement and not so data intensive with simple data also sometimes only uh, a few data points are available, still you should be able to probably calculate the average growth uh, either using very simple method or little bit better approach or technique and you will be able to get a result. They are usually aggregate model as I said, so when I talked about different approaches I said aggregate demand model I mentioned as one. Uh, separate approach, but many of the approach which are mentioned earlier like the trend analysis or time series model, they are also aggregate model, but aggregate models also could be of other types. There are so many other kinds of aggregate models which are available. You have uh, discussed, we have discussed in details about the four stage uh, transportation planning in the context of passenger transport demand models, modeling. And there we have discussed so many models which are all basically aggregate type model. So, these are aggregate and therefore, uh, these models specifically they are aggregate type models. So, they have got all limitations whatever aggregate models have all those limitations are there for this kind of analysis and they do not explicitly incorporate important explanatory variables. For example, you were saying the growth of freight demand. 
but the growth of freight demand doesn't happen on its own there are certain factors certain reasons why that growth is happening so we we don't consider those reasons or those uh, explanatory variables when we are trying to model it so that's the kind of limitation with trend or time series model in general so the next approach elasticity model it this methods we in this method we try to overcome this limitation what i just mentioned so we consider in a way some influencing variables logical manner we we try to consider them and then we try to see the sensitivity of demand to an influencing variable maybe the model cost whatever mode you are choosing what is the cost of uh, choosing or using that mode so par you know how the demand is sensitive uh, to the to those selected variables and how we measure it we measure it by the elasticity if you know the concept of elasticity it is fine uh, i also teach uh, this elasticity in some other course there are different ways you can measure the elasticity generally percentage change in demand by percentage change in the uh, influencing variables so uh, per 1% change in whatever variable you take 1% change in that value because of that how much percentage change in demand is going to happen so typically uh, probably the the cost goes up by uh, a particular mode of transport naturally the demand will come down or demand may come down so among several elasticity measures there are different ways you can measure elasticity elasticity uh, the concept is very interesting uh, and simple but you can quantify it using maybe uh, different measures like shrinkage ratio you can use uh, you can use the uh, arc elasticity midpoint arc elasticity uh, you can take log and then also calculate the uh, elasticity the midpoint arc elasticity generally very well uh, approximate the elasticity what you can get by taking the log so there are different measures uh, different ways you can quantify the elasticity and the appropriateness of a particular measure uh, depends on what data is available to you uh, you know because what what kind of elasticity elasticity with respect to what that depends on what kind of data you have with you and uh, of course what is the specific application context any modeling whether it's passenger demand modeling goods demand modeling uh, the it is always very context specific what is the context what i'm trying to uh, solve please remember my discussion in the uh, very initial uh, class of this course urban transportation systems planning where i said the objective scope of uh, the objective then uh, you know within objective i said problem definition um, constraints inputs outputs so the context has to be known very clearly and whatever you are trying to do you are trying to find out elasticity you want to use elasticity but you have to keep in mind why you are trying to develop such model so what is the specific application context and it should make sense as per the context elasticity method is again simple to use not really complicated and you are considering the influencing variables but has its own limitation as well one thing may be not accounting for multiple factors simultaneously that also has been uh, highlighted by many researchers then 
coming to the next uh, type of model what is called network models of economics and logistics. Now, network models of logistics focus on modeling of shipper as well as carrier behavior, both we are considering. So, in a way we are capturing both demand and supply relationships indirectly. indirectly. Uh, and these are very, very uh, important because they actually drive the freight movement. It is all basically demand supply interaction. So, that demand supply relationships are captured in, an, in, a, in a manner. Network models of logistics hold great promise I should say for modeling especially the intercity freight flow, but because of the complexity to implement and more intensive data requirement obviously, if you want to develop such more kind of models you need uh, much more data as compared to the previous methods. Implementation of these models may be a viable long term strategy for state wide freight demand forecasting. So, in larger perspective when you are uh, doing this uh, freight demand modeling because uh, you want to uh, use it for state wide freight demand uh, forecasting then such kind of methods can be useful. Then coming to general classifications of models or general variety of or categories of model which we can use as I said that grossly we can look at this modeling approaches uh, with a different you know perspective. One is whether we are doing the aggregate models or whether we are trying to develop disaggregate models. Now, aggregate demand models estimate commodity flow volumes instead of you know it is at the as you understand we have discussed it in the context of specifically the mode choice models. We said that you know aggregate models to disaggregate models the trip generation models we said uh, earlier that is again a aggregate based model, but mode choice model disaggregate mode choice model we discussed that is that that is where you, uh, you got introduced to uh, disaggregate uh, modeling. So, disaggregate models in freight sector are those that have close parallels to four step passenger driven travel demand modeling approach. You try to see the mode choice behavior, how the mode choice is made, how the route choice is uh, made, right, but at the disaggregate level. So, the uh, whatever you have studied actually in, uh, in the context of uh, passenger travel demand modeling. All those concepts are useful, but you have to apply it suitably. Remember that many disaggregate models have focused on mode choice behavior and estimation of model split, but it has to match with the context, not that everything what you have applied uh, or used in the context of passenger travel demand models you can apply it exactly in the same manner for the goods transport because the factors are very different, the complexities are different, the considerations are very different and very unique. I have mentioned it in uh, the earlier occasions also. So, as an approach the disaggregate demand models have got lot of promise and uh, both for passenger demand and also for uh, modeling the freight demands, uh, the disaggregate models have got really a lot of promise and that is what is going to dominate the future applications with, with as and an, as an when the, 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 the data availability part is sorted out and over time things are going to change. So, I would expect rather more and more application of uh, disaggregate models even in the context of modeling of freight travel demand. 
then economic input output method input output this is again a different kind of analysis which involves the use of economic inputs and output indicators to determine the level of economic activity that drive freight transportation demand. Uh, just to give a very simple example, uh, we cannot as I say we cannot discuss in, in, in details, but let us take an example. So, typical such inputs may be uh, you take an academic unit, uh, take an economic unit. So, what are the inputs? The typical inputs are capital, the typical inputs are labor, land, right. So, these are the inputs that can add value through economic activity and then these are fed through an input output analysis matrix to determine various outputs such as the quantity of goods or services that are produced from this uh, economic activity units by type, by uh, geographical location, by uh, temporal frame, right. So, basically uh, it is basically uh, mapping the economic input and the uh, outputs that process how that relationship is uh, happening. So, then based on that understanding the further works can be done uh, in the perspective of demand modeling. There are many unique aspects of freight transportation that often render direct translation of passenger travel demand models inappropriate. I mentioned this in a slightly different form in my earlier slide, but overall uh, since you are familiar with the four stage planning process and since uh, I have discussed in details about the four stage transportation uh, planning uh, throughout my course or major, major part of the course was actually devoted for that. That is what I am saying this that overall four stage transportation modeling structure like the trip generation, trip distribution, mode choice, traffic assignment can be adopted to freight travel demand modeling also since even in this case of freight transportation trips are generated, trips are also distributed, split between or split among different alternative modes and finally, assigned to network. So, fundamentally all this also do happen for freight transport as all these things happen for the passenger transport. So, conceptually you know you can map it nicely, but one has to remember that entities that need to be considered for example, type of commodity uh, commodities and then I say the, the size of the consignment right requirement whether you want to transport liquid or you want to transport perishable goods or you want to transport other kinds of consumer goods right and the factors involved in freight transportation process we have discussed those also in details right. They are very unique and they are much different from what we do or what we consider in the case of uh, passenger travel demand mod forecasting models. So, although the four stage transportation model can be applied, can be mapped, but not that everything can be borrowed directly because here the context is very different. The factors influencing the uh, freight demands are very different from the factors which influence the passenger travel demand or the decision making process is also somewhat different. So, you can apply the broad four stage transport planning framework, but taking care of the uh, differences. So, the basic four stage freight transportation planning as I said consists of determining how much and where goods are generated and used. It is transported from one point to another point that again is same like passenger demand. 
estimating volume of goods moving from each origin to its destination, then selecting mode or a set of modes for moving goods and finally, determining the route to be used and somewhere in between either in step 2 or in step 3 steps are you can see I have do not I have not written steps, but I have written it like tick. So, the second or third tick you can consider the volume of goods must be converted into vehicle as we said the passenger demands get converted into vehicular demand either uh, dis distribution stage or definitely at the uh, you know mode choice stage either you know either uh, before uh, after distribution or before distribution. As I said that the mode choice and the uh, distribution uh, we assume that they are happening just in sequence, but they can even, even alter the place. So, as I said that goods transport demand is very different and unique and complex as compared to the passenger transport demand. I would like to again summarize uh, with a slightly different angle using a slightly different angle or a slightly different perspective that how they are different. They are different in terms of units of measurement. In passenger transport demand it is very easy how many persons want to travel, but freight is measured in different units. You can measure it in terms of by weight, by value, by volume. So, it is again complex and different from passenger transport demand. The second is the value of time is very different passenger transport context the value of time and the freight transport context the value of time the considerations are very different and here it may vary a lot. Say for uh, example, your value of time uh, could be very different or much higher much much higher when you are transporting uh, say fish or vegetables or any perishable goods. But whereas, if you are transporting some other kinds of good saving of 10 minutes, 15 minutes or half an hour time may not really matter. So, the value of time is actually very much a function of what kind of commodity you are transporting. Whereas, in the passenger transport context it depends probably on the purpose of the trip. If I am going to the office I have to reach to the office on time. So, the value of travel time for what trips could be much higher. The higher the income probably the uh, value of time will be higher generally expected to be higher. So, it depends on you know socioeconomic characteristics it depends on the trip purpose, but here the value of time predominantly get dominated some cases the value of travel time could be very negligible. So, if you give just somebody scanning say so maybe a truck uh, carrying a, a coal. So, whether to take a toll road or whether to not to take a toll road that decision may be may not be interested even to take a toll road, but if it is the truck is carrying the fish the fish has to reach to the market right at the, uh, at the at the destination point right at early morning otherwise the fish cannot go to the local markets in the city on the same day. And if it cannot go to the local market you cannot use that fish probably or storage will be much more expensive. Similarly, the vegetables it will be uh, you know wasted. So, the value of travel time could be higher much higher. Third loading and unloading no assistance is required for passenger whereas, for freight it requires assistance at both origin and destination of the trip at both ends the loading and unloading has to happen. So, the, the, that part needs to be duly considered in the in the overall demand models overall in the uh, context of mode choice right. Then types of vehicle now as I said that transport goods transport very very unique the requirement is requirements are very very unique requirements. So, passengers only require only seat to be comfortable if I am travelling in a bus I just want to sit in the bus that may be my best requirement best expectation, but freight requires a wide variety of accommodation 
from refrigerated container as I see if you are carrying some medicines and from vaccines which need to be maintained uh, or transported maintaining certain uh, temperature that is a different requirement to dry bulk uh, hoppers uh, to uh, liquid bulk tankers you are carrying the petroleum product the diesel petrol uh, is transported uh, from the refinery or the uh, nodal point to the uh, to different petrol pumps uh, to sometimes you need flat beds you know the, 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 the transport requirement will change in time. So, the type of vehicle is not just one type not just truck, but within the goods transport within trucks also there are so many varieties. So, that is very very unique right. So, all these actually make the goods transportation very different and as you can see much more complex than the passenger transportation part and also according to the demand model part. So, free trip generation as I said that fourth stage planning can be applied easily. So, generation of freight demand and generation of freight vehicle trips are two different things. Freight generation is the tonnage or maybe the volume of freight that is to be transported while freight trip generation is basically the number of freight vehicles or units that are required to transport. So, two things are uh, different. In passenger cars, uh, there is a tight consequence generally between amount of trip produced and the uh, associated number of vehicle trips, but especially if you consider that the transit share is small and everybody is traveling by car during office time, you know that occupancy is going to be 1 or 1.2 or 1.3 not more than that it does not vary so much. So, the number of persons and number of uh, vehicles is straightforward relationship, but freight it is not so it is not so how the freight how much I may not really need a full truck load of goods I may require that multiple uh, such units may be required type of vehicle requirement may be very uh, good if I if the truck is not fully loaded if I am not utilizing the whole capacity my uh, you know pricing factor will be very very different. So, then you know the all kinds of uh, you know consideration uh, have to come and which will make it much more uh, a complex phenomena. So, in contrast to uh, freight transportation many business could change their uh, shipment sizes in some cases may be several orders of magnitude uh, to, to minimize their total logistic cost. So, the cost play a very vital role and that that gets interlinked as I said. So, the base data uh, of amount of freight generated to and from uh, or attracted to an urban area is often difficult to acquire that is a difficulty which I have already mentioned in the context of the data, but I wanted to mention it once again. And when such kind of data are available uh, units are in average number of tons how many tons uh, of goods you are transporting we quantify it in that case or maybe sometimes the value of that goods. So, maybe if it is Indian rupees then only simply average rupees per value uh, or average rupees of value right. So, either in terms of tons or rupees right if the if it is uh, converted into value. So, altogether what we discussed here we discussed the problem and the challenges of in the uh, planners faced when we are going to do the goods transport demand modeling the kind of problem we face with the data data is always a challenge, but here it is even a more challenge. Then we discussed about various demand modeling approaches, trend and time series analysis to elasticity method to network models for uh, economics and logistics, then aggregate disaggregate approaches for modeling and then economic input output method. And then we said that four stage demand modeling can be mapped with uh, due consideration to all the characteristics and the requirement of uh, freight uh, related issues and uh, started our little bit introductory discussion about the freight generation and attraction. We shall continue in the next lecture. Thank you so much.